Well, thank you for returning after your brownies, because I understand they had a devastating impact on some people. <laughs> um, and certainly, I'm happy that you've come back after lunch, and I know you'll be happy you came back after lunch um, with this panel of really unique and interesting perspectives. My name is Michael Beeman. I am a visiting scholar here at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center, and it's my real privilege to be here to moderate this panel uh, and at this um, important event. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Fiji, thank the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission for organizing the panel, for being the inspiration behind the panel. Um, and the fact that I think the government of Fiji stepped up in this way really under, underscores the, the importance of listening to the voices of the localities that are struggling with the issues that were so eloquently covered uh, in the morning sessions. Um, so this panel is gonna focus a lot on place, on context, on location, and how these struggles and these challenges are being met in very unique and different ways given very unique and different circumstances that uh, exist in, be it an individual nation of a few thousand people on an atoll or in the desert, for example. Um, so we have a great panel with these unique perspectives, and uh, let me just introduce briefly the panelists before we get underway. Um, Joel Abraham. Joel Abraham is the chief executive officer, and I would say add the word dynamic to that, <laughs> of the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission, uh, which promotes effective competition and fair trade and protects consumers and businesses in the country of the nation of Fiji. Um, but... Um, uh, I also was really impressed because I went to the website of his agency, and as I told him last night, there is no profile of the, of, of the, the chairman to, or the CEO to be found on the website, which uh, reflects a, a kind of communal spirit, I think, of an agency that is trying to work together, and, um, but is led by a really impressive individual um, who has great business and public sector experience, uh, in regulatory compliance, finance, and business uh, adv advisory capacities with um, the private sectors in Australia, Fiji, and in Tonga. Um, he is very focused on international affairs and really bringing together uh, economics, international affairs, laws, grassroots, mobilization, and activism. Uh, we all need a, jo a Joel. We all need several Joels in our public sectors. So <laughs> congratulations to you. Um, next, i um, really excited to introduce uh, Lorraine Akiba, who is the president and CEO of LHA Ventures. She has incredible technical knowledge and expertise in a wide range of um, sectors, but particularly in the energy sector, um, where she has spent a great deal of her career, including as a, um, a commissioner of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission for a number of years in the 2010s, and um, has now advising and putting her skill set to work by advising companies and governments uh, in the region and, and, um, and elsewhere. Um, and uh, it's just a very interesting uh, person to get to know. So thank you for coming, Lorraine. And um, Diana, um, let me find your, make sure, I, yes, perfect. <laughs> Diana Bowman, also um, a real pleasure to have Diana with us. She is a professor of law at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law and Associate Dean for Applied Research and Partnerships at Arizona State University. Applied Research and Partnerships, that means implementation, right? Mm -hmm. This means this is what we were talking about earlier, earlier today. Um, she deals with some really complicated legal and policy issues. She is, I did go to your bio website and saw that just a prolific um, publisher of an incredible number of articles and journals and, and book chapters and the rest. Uh, she's also very active with external organizations from the Australian government to the OECD um, and has a Bachelor of Law and a Doctor, uh, a doctor of Philosophy in Law from Monash University in Australia. So this is the dynamic panelists we have for you today. Um, but let's begin with Joel. We'll just do some short um, presentations, introductory remarks. Joel has a slide deck. Um, and then we'll turn to Lorraine and then Diana, and then we'll move into a, a stage conversation and then open up to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beeman. And uh, in fact, uh, I was remarking that uh, our finance minister and deputy prime minister, his name is Biman Prasad, which is uh, very similar sounding to uh, <laughs> your setting. 
when I was putting together the panel, uh, talking to uh, Lorraine and talking to uh, Dr. Chale, who unfortunately could not be here, on talking about resilient infrastructure, and especially in the Pacific, and we know what the resilient infrastructure needs are. As you'll see, that's, uh, that's one of our major highways that got, uh, uh, that collapsed as a result of uh, heavy downpour. And uh, when you talk resilient infrastructure, we live through it. So uh, that basically meant supply routes to Bunwa Levu, which is our second largest island, was, uh, was cut off. Now, uh, this was a famous saying by our former prime minister and also the uh, chair of the uh, uh, COP23, uh, uh, Honorable Josei Abarenge Bani Marama. He is no longer the prime minister. Uh, and he said, we are all in the same canoe, not just an island nation, but the world, uh, but the whole world. No one is immune to the effects of climate change. All 7.5 billion of us are in the same boat. So we may be in different places, but uh, it, it affects us equally. Now, uh, this is basically an outline. Uh, my team said, I have to talk about us. I have to, <laughs> they're the ones that paid to get me here. Uh, then, of course, challenges, impacts, and, uh, and short remarks. Uh, the FCCC is the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission, which is a multi-sector regulator. And uh, it uh, started with the Prices and Incomes Board in 1975. So Fiji was batted by Hurricane Bibi, which is a Category 3 cyclone. And post that, the government saw that the prices of goods and services had started escalating. And in order to counter inflation, a counter inflation act was put together that gave rise to the Prices and Incomes Board. So we were birthed out of the direct impacts of climate change in the 70s. And that was uh, uh, changed to the Commerce Commission in 2010. And in 2017, I became the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission to focus on market-based competition and consumer welfare. Uh, there's a line there, and you'll see uh, three other uh, symbols there or signs there. One is Opera. Opera is not the uh, one in Sydney, the <laughs> Opera House. It is the Office of Pacific Energy Regulators <laughs> Alliance, so 13 countries. Then there's PINSA. PINSA is the uh, Pacific Island Network of Competition, Consumer Protection, and Economic Regulators. And the last one is the Asia Pacific Regulatory Center. Now, you'll see a difference. The top point is a local uh, national regulator. The middle ones, OPERA and PINSA, are networks. And the third one is a center. And the center is one that sits independently. It's not with any university but it's meant to work with individual regulators so that you're able to institutionalize knowledge at a regional level. What we found is when people left the local bodies who were also members or directors in the regional bodies, all the knowledge left with them. So the idea is to uh, ensure that we retain such knowledge. Now, the FCCC has four major functions. We are a competition regulator. We are also a consumer protection enforcement agency. We are a price regulator, and we also do licensing. In the energy space, we do anything from licensing for energy, anybody wanting to enter the energy space, to price regulation, to consumer complaints and consumer welfare. So it's a really end-to-end -end regulation. Now, I'll start off with challenges because this is what we get in the Pacific, challenges and a lot of them. So I'll, I'll go back to challenges that have been quite prevalent in driving the cost of living as well as cost of energy, energy excess, energy justice issues in the Pacific. Uh, one, pre-pandemic, the U.S.-China trade war began. Uh, that led to companies in uh, more developed jurisdictions having large orders out of China. And what that meant was container shortage. What it meant for our people in the Pacific was that if there was no container shortage, uh, we would get goods on a normal basis. The consignments would come in regularly. The turnovers would be fine. But with the uh, excess orders in other developed jurisdictions, because of container shortages and freight, uh, freight issues, we could not get access to materials. So if we were building roads, if we were building hospitals, uh, any sort of infrastructure, we could not get access to materials. So there was massive cost overruns. And that led to issues of project feasibility. Then the pandemic hit. Uh, where's the demand? We need supply. Supply market just vanished. Demand remained constant. People were locked up in their houses. Very good time, opportune time to work on infrastructure because there's nobody's using them, there's no disruption. But then everybody's too scared to go out and do anything. So we all were crammed into our, our own homes. Our then government was uh, led by the uh, prime minister, who was also a former military commander. So he came with very strong policies, no jab, no job. And if 
uh, the outbreak was found in certain areas that cordoned off the area with military mobilization, so you couldn't move in and out. And so it became very difficult to uh, be able to work on, on projects. Uh, and post-pandemic recovery, uh, as I said, yet, let's take over another country. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine war escalated and, and I mean, it's still going on. Uh, climate change, of course, is a constant threat. Individualism in the, in the space that we exist, we find that the private sector does not have economies of scale. So in, in countries like in the Asian countries, we have the population base. Fiji is the second largest country in the Pacific with 900,000 population. We were 900,000 10 years ago, we're still 900,000. We just break even with our population growth. And then the smaller countries like Kiribati and Tuvalu, at all countries that have 20,000 people. So where there's no commercial feasibility, how do you expect the private sector to enter? That's where we have got donor agencies and multilateral partners. The issue that we face is everybody seems to be doing their own thing, uh, whether it's resilient infrastructure. Right? You've got ADB doing its work. You've got IMF doing its work. You've got World Bank doing its part. You've got the European delegation doing its part. And everybody's doing something. And there's four different consultants because when they come, they want to talk to heads of agencies and have to talk to all four of them. Now, it would be easier to just get them all in one room and just do a presentation like this but uh, individualism and replication. There's a race on who can do it better. And then the last one I've said, it's unforeseen, a black swan event. We don't know. We did not know the pandemic would come. We had no idea Ukraine would uh, be uh, invaded by Russia. Now the uh, Israel conflict in Gaza, that's happening. So there's always that black swan event that we cannot uh, predict or we may not know. Then the supply chain disruptions, there has high cost, especially for raw material procurement. Now, when you're in the corner of the world, uh, Fiji is just a dot on the map, and in the corner of the world, and most Pacific Island uh, nations are as such. We don't have regular shipping uh, coming in, getting in materials. We don't manufacture anything. Uh, our manufacturing industries are basically importing raw materials from elsewhere and doing manufacture in Fiji. So then you have to explain to people why the cost is still so high. So supply chain disruptions are there, and there's no immediate uh, end or insight for the climate crisis. In the last four years, we've been battered by 16 cyclones in Fiji, including the T.C. Winston, which was the largest cyclone ever to make landfall in the southern hemisphere, category 5 cyclone, wiped off one-third of the Fijian GDP, and that was the direct impact. Damage to infrastructure, the electricity company, because they're regulated by the FCCC, they came to us. Initial damages, $13 million. That was just from the first round of assessment. And in, in the grand scheme of things, $13 million may seem small, but in the Pacific context, it is quite high, especially when the uh, poverty line is roughly about $30,000 Fijian dollars, or uh, in U.S. dollars, it'd be about $14,000 U.S. dollars. So on a comparative scale, that meant a huge impact for us. And then there's inevitable structural economic challenges, confidence. So if markets don't have confidence, there's political issues, uh, social issues, climatic issues, there's high country risk. High country risk means investors come in, they look for high levels of returns. High level of returns means financing goes up and the interest rates are uh, driven up. Then there's the social balance. The prices are there and then you need to balance wages as well. You constantly need to tell the people, okay, we'll increase minimum wages. In the last two years, we've increased minimum wages three times uh, because of the social pressure and also because we have elections in the next two years. So you can understand why government is very keen to get uh, uh, wages up. Now, what that means is then the cost of doing projects, especially infrastructure projects, and not just getting them on the ground, but repair and maintenance and ongoing cost and keeping them up or replacement costs also get high. So that flow and effect gets there. Then there are unique challenges for not just Fiji, but for seeds. We are very small in size. We have limited resources. And then we're very vulnerable to external shocks, whether it's the GFC, whether it's uh, climatic conditions. And climate, uh, adverse climatic conditions doesn't even have to occur in the Pacific forest to be affected. If it happens in a source market, and there's disruptions there, and what happens is everybody comes in and says, OK, <coughs> will come in and buy. Everybody wants to stockpile. Everybody wants access to resources, products. We can't afford those. So if it's the steel market, we face shortages simply because somebody else has come and purchased more. So there's a climatic conditions that's happening here. I mean, Florida is being uh, bettered right now as we speak. 
the demand from the US will increase, which will have an impact in the global market. And there's a very small play in the global market. And when you talk to suppliers, sometimes they say, you don't even, your national demand doesn't even meet our minimum order quantities. That is the reality for us. So how do we then compete? So it doesn't even, we don't even have to feel it. There could be a nice sunny day, good, uh, you could be sitting on a beach in Fiji and still feel the impacts. Uh, then the implementation barriers, resource limitations, logistical issues, and the major one is shortage of technical expertise. Last year alone, we've lost close to 80,000 people, 23,000 families also have left Fiji for Australia and New Zealand, better paying jobs. And during lunch, I was uh, talking uh, to a colleague, and I said there was one person that we got on board, and we paid a uh, very handsome rate according to Fijian standards. Got him trained, got him certified to the Australia Clean Energy Council as an engineer. Uh, all certifications done, sent him to a conference in Australia. He got a job from there, <laughs> paying five times more than what we can afford. So, <laughs> And then he's left. So we have to start over again. Now we've got a fresh graduate in his place, and then we have to restart the process. And there is no knowledge base that we are able to capture. So how do you build a knowledge management system that can help that? Then there's bureaucratic processes within multilateral uh, uh, partners and donor agencies. You have to jump through hoops and hoops and hoops uh, before you can get funding mobilization or resource procurement because the systems are developed for bigger countries. Uh, smaller countries like ours sometimes will be filling these 20-page forms and most of them are not, not applicable, not applicable. But you still have to justify why, uh, why it's there and what, what you can do to... Uh, alleviate some of the concerns that are there in those application forms. And volatility is now the new normal. It's the world that we live in. Uh, Post-pandemic, we said, no, this is the new normal. And the only thing that's now certain is the high degree of uncertainty, fragility, and unpredictability. And what we need to do is prepare, prepare for and adapt to radically changing uh, patterns. The environments are changing. Uh, countries are changing. There's high inflationary pressures, and cost of living is an uh, issue in all countries. And cost of living basically means when consumers say cost of living, governments and private sector generally through the unions have to respond to higher wages and then there's a price wage spiral. So what do we need? Maybe we need stability and more security. And uh, the earlier point on SDG 16 on peace, why it's important, security is very important. Uh, ask a country that's going to focus since it's uh, 50 year independence. We can tell you why security is important. Now, I thought about writing something on the impact slide, but I thought I'd just let you see it for your, for your own self. Mm -hmm. That is impact. You want to talk about resilient infrastructure, you want to talk about the impacts of climate change, that is what happens to us. November to mid of November to mid of April is our cyclone season. And our prime minister will literally come on the news and say, can you pray that we don't get hit by the cyclone? That is our response in Fiji. <laughs> you pray. You believe and say, God will do something that you don't get hit by this. And category three, category four, category five cyclone. And then flooding is separate, not even talking about flooding, which happens almost every time there's a heavy rain, a heavy downpour for about four or five hours. You've got flooding somewhere. Some road has washed away. Some bridge has washed away. And whatever remains, then we've got very uh, uh, smart people in Fiji. They know that policing at this time is, uh, is weak. They'll come in and they'll take parts of scrap metals and they'll take parts of pavements get missing and then you'll find it at somebody else's house. And, and that is really the impact on, on our infrastructure. Solutions? A solution is, I say, you know, infrastructure, building infrastructure is good. Hey? But if you want resilient infrastructure, you need to have the human capital. What's the point of building all these things and there's nobody to maintain them? There's nobody to replace them. There's nobody to look at the longevity. So investment in human capital and development of human capital is, is quite critical. Uh, there's a need for skilled workforce capabilities for adapting, for innovating, and addressing the unique challenges that we face in our region, and to build capacity within regulatory processes. And I, I always say this, uh, when you look at world leaders, we go and we make all these fancy SDGs, right? Our prime minister goes and they hold hands, they sing Kumbaya, and you know, it's all good, we'll change the world. And then the national leaders, they say, we'll make development plans, and the development plans in, in a four-year period, two years is taken to make development plans. Know, which then has to be then implemented. And then in the next two years, the government's probably going to change or new government's going to come in, and they're going to come in and do their own plan. 
and then they will put national policies, infrastructure policy, energy policy. But you know where things come to die? Is after that you hit regulatory processes. So you hit either border control where you have to you know, get goods into the country. You hit regulatory processes with the competition consumer commission or the pricing regulator or the economic regulator or the energy regulator or the environment regulator. And as private sector, when people go in, that is where things come to die. That is the bottleneck, uh, really. And so we worked on two regional networks, which is Opera and Pinsa. And after working through these networks, looking at people that I used to sit around in the first year are no longer around. Uh, in fact, Lorraine was the TA uh, with the ADB to help set up Opera. And she can tell you, I probably am the only one that's left in that yeah. initial period. And so everybody's left. And every year I attend the senior regional energy officials meeting, there's 13 different people are across the table. And every year we talk about the same thing. We get very excited. We're going to do things. Next year, nothing gets done. And we come back and we talk about the same thing, <laughs> which is the next step. Uh, the, uh, we worked and had some preliminary discussions with DFAT and uh, some colleagues at the ADB to set up a regulatory center that can institutionalize knowledge at a regional level and continuously provide support to regulators. So it did would not matter whether labor mobility uh, being a reality in the Pacific, whether people moved or they moved into other spaces within government, or they moved out of government into the private sector, or they left the country and moved out. If you had a regional uh, knowledge center that could retain knowledge, so you don't have to do four feasibility studies for the same thing, so you can do one and share it across. We developed a mini grid tool in Fiji for decentralization of energy systems so people could get access. Tonga came and said, it's a very nice idea. I said, yo, we want to share it. I said, sure, we'll share it. I went back. The legal team said, you need to take approvals. We have to take appro approvals from seven different layers, including the Solicitor General. And none of these seven people have any idea what a mini grid tool is. So you can imagine the pain we have to go through to convince that we should share this information. And what is, uh, and this was developed by development financing. So. What was the whole purpose of putting development financing in it if it's retained within a sovereign? So we said if there was a regional center that sat independently and was with the Pacific Island Forum, affiliated with the forum, then we could uh, institutionalize knowledge at a regional level and collaborate more effectively. Uh, then we talking about the new streamlined uh, need for streamlined processes and collaboration. And how do we improve this across sectors? How do we use regulatory processes for social impact. So what we did in Fiji is uh, we got the utility to report on gender pay gaps. And they said, why you can't access to do that? There's got nothing to do with tariffs. We said, well, if you don't want to do that, you won't get the tariff. So either you comply with our requirements or, or you don't. So now we've got a utility sitting in Fiji that now is reporting on, on, on gender issues, is reporting on environmental issues. and. We said, there's so many people that don't have access to electricity. They said, well, this is not commercially feasible. There's only about 50 households there. Why should we go there? It's the investment cost and the payback period is too low. Our board will not allow looking at the internal rate of return. We're not going to invest. We came up with a concept of non-commercial obligation that uses cross-subsidization in the regulatory system. So people who could afford it were paying one cent extra to this non-commercial obligation fund and then eventually people in these rural areas could get access. And we replicated this across energy, water, telecommunication. Of course, I can't uh, highlight SDG 17 enough, which is the importance of partnerships uh, with governments, uh, international agencies, private enterprise, et cetera. And this is basically to derive accountability and outcomes. Because I think we talk a lot, uh, just don't do much enough. Uh, then uh, harmonizing regional regulatory standards. and. The Pacific has one market, and this is a concept that Lorraine uh, coined. <laughs> so we said, we're not small island states. We are a big ocean state. Mm. Because if you remove, if you start looking at us as a big ocean state, then the dynamics become different. Because if I look at a large investor, uh, and I say, would you be interested to invest in the Fijian space? They say, oh, no, the economies of scale just isn't there. You know, a 10 million project or a 15 million project, small, it, it's too small for us. But what if Fiji, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, uh, PNG, Kiribati could all be looked at was uh, one market? And you could have a distributed system, but by one entity or by investors in the private sector. And you start looking at it as a big ocean state. 
and that is where we are looking at harmonizing regional uh, regulatory standards. And conclusion, I mean, we believe that it's a, coll a collective responsibility for sustainable development. And it is essential, I, I think, and I feel it's essential for human capital development. If you want to have resilient infrastructure, you need the human capital, because that's what we don't have. And uh, lastly, it's, there's a call for action that we need to have collective efforts in investing in people, fostering collaboration, as well as embracing innovation to unlock the Pacific's potential, because our potential is grossly understated. Uh, thank you. And I was asked to go back to this slide so you can, it can be there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joel. Um, both for your um, just really pragmatic, practical reminders of what it takes day in and day out to try and make um, this kind of difference, uh, particularly you know, in a Pacific Island nation, um, a, a, a big ocean state, I should yeah. say, um, where one cyclone is the difference between everything yeah. in many ways. Um, it's a really powerful reminder. So thank you for leaving that up for all of us. Lorraine, I assume you feel some familiar oh, themes yeah. in that, I, but, I but please, so. I, I please bring so. it up from Hawaii. First of all, I just want to share from Hawaii, and this is what we always do when we speak from Hawaii. We always greet our audience uh, you know, as part of our family, ohana. So I always say, aloha, and <laughs> we expect an aloha back. So after lunch, we need to have from everybody here a very robust aloha. aloha. All right. So we are all in a canoe here together, having the dialogue, which is very important. And it's not just about, uh, you know, uh, talking the talk, it's about walking the walk. And so that's why I think, uh, you know, on our panel, we're going to talk about, as, as Joel's teed up, what are the solutions, what are the actions, what are we doing? And um, my portion is to really share the lessons learned and the best practices from Hawaii, which uh, as many of you have affinity, I know some of you have worked in Hawaii, East West Center, have uh, you know, come through Hawaii and uh, are still working uh, with many stakeholders in our state. Um, and we are part of the Pacific Rim. We are we're technically part of uh, opera, as Joel uh, uh, alluded to tonight. I first got to know uh, the Pacific Rim nations because of the, the work I've done for Asian Development Bank and also um, in the region from when I was a commissioner, uh, I would do work for USAID and State Department as we go out and share the knowledge that Hawaii has. And, I'm proud to say that Hawaii as, a, um, as an island uh, community, an island state, uh, we were leading in the U.S. We were the first state in the U.S. to adopt 100% renewable energy uh, mandate uh, and 100% decarbonization mandate. We did that as early as, as far as the renewable energy in 2008, even before the SDGs were on, on the horizon. Uh, we also formed a, a private public-private partnership in 2014 to implement uh, in 2014, a change to 100% decarbonization. So this means Hawaii, by 2045, uh, we must be totally decarbonized in all sectors. We must have 100% uh, uh, clean and renewable energy, which is by no means an easy task. But after we did that, many other states in the U.S. adopted that. Many other countries have followed in the Pacific Islands as well. So as, as Joel has reminded you, uh, focus um, on resilient and sustainable infrastructure uh, is a part of the reality of all Pacific Island nations and communities. We are at ground zero for climate change, and you can see that in the, in the slides behind us. It's not just the extreme weather of hurricanes, typhoons. We see what hurricanes can do. We see it on the East Coast now in the El Nino cycle. El Nino, it would be back in the Pacific where we will have tremendous Category 5 hurricanes that will come through uh, every month, every, you know, every uh, week, and it, luckily they don't always hit the islands, but the threat is always there because of warming, uh, global warming because of warming oceans. So we are at ground zero for sea level rise. Many of our colleagues who aren't here today uh, from the Pacific Islands, they're not volcanic islands like Fiji and Hawaii. They are coral, coral atolls. So places like Kiribati are already underwater, Marshall Islands. And uh, Dave Kim in the, in the earlier panel today talked about climate refugees. We already have many of our, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, sister countries having their citizens come to Hawaii as climate refugees because it's no longer tenable for them to be in communities uh, that are underwater. So they're seeking new opportunities, uh, you know, first in Hawaii and then perhaps maybe in other areas where they can continue to get education, continue to provide leadership uh, to go back home to, to, to address these issues. But as we said, that requires a paradigm shift. So I mean, kudos to you know, SDG 9A. It makes specific reference to uh, enhancing phys uh, financial, technical, uh, and uh, technological support uh, to small island developing states. But as, uh, as we have uh, done in terms of our Pacific uh, island countries, we change the paradigm. We disrupt that view because actually SID sounds like some kind of medical condition. Uh, I think big ocean states, when you think about it, and this was actually, this term, this concept was not because of me. It's actually because of some very visionary leaders from Hawaii. Our first Native Hawaiian astronaut, Lacey Veach, when he went up, you know, become part of the, of the space station, and he looked out at the blue marble we call Earth. He marveled at how when, when, the, when the Earth rotates, the bulk of what you see is blue. Oceans, Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Caribbean Ocean, Indian Ocean, and in those oceans are islands. And when you talk about that physical area, that area, the islands connected in all those oceans is larger than any continent, is larger than any landmass territory on this planet. So therefore, we are big ocean states who share, right? We share our insights, we share our experience, connections, and collaboration are a tremendous catalyst. And because we are at ground zero, uh, we are, can be leaders, uh, leadership group for innovation and sustainability based on cultural values uh, of our native and indigenous cultures. I mean, it, many of the native uh, cultures and indigenous people on all, on all the islands have been pr practicing sustainability before sustainability became a buzzword, you know, on social media. I mean, it, it's the way the, the communities were managed. It's the way islands uh, have been historically managed uh, in order to survive. So it is this shared knowledge, it is this culture that we are able to demonstrate. And in Hawaii, we have actually been... Uh, you know, walking the walk uh, in terms of trying to uh, and successfully demonstrating and implementing uh, changes, implementing things in terms of uh, clean energy transition, inter implementing things in various sectors of our economy, such as, um, you know, instead of just being a resort tourist-based economy, trying to look at regenerative and sustainable tourism, and also being a knowledge-based economy where, you know, we can be a facilitator, the Geneva of the Pacific, to have a beautiful place where people come to convene and uh, share ideas, policies, uh, create uh, you know, innovations. Um, so I wanted to just translate this back to the SDGs because I, um, uh, we're here to talk about how we're going to actually implement, how we're going to actually realize the goals of, of the SDGs and in particular SDG number nine. Well, in Hawaii, as part of our natural progression, even before 2015, we had formulated, uh, like I said, the public-private partnership an entity called Hawaii Green Growth, and I would encourage you to go to the website of Hawaii Green Growth. Uh, we established something called the Aloha Plus Challenge after the SDGs were promulgated in 2015 and adopted uh, with all the nations in order to make our island contribution to implementing and achieving those sustainability goals for Hawaii. So we also were the first island uh, group the Hawaii Green Growth, that was invited by uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to be part of the Local 2030 Islands Network, which is the world's first global island peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, network uh, devoted to advancing the sustainable um, development goals through locally driven um, solutions. Uh, and this is a network that you know, provides peer-to-peer -peer, uh, platform for engagement amongst and um, between islands to share experiences, spread knowledge, uh, raise ambition, promote solidarity, which we've done on many occasions, and identify and implement practical solutions. So we were the first to be asked by the, by the UN Secretary General to join this, to provide leadership, and in fact, we have since, uh, since we, we joined in, uh, in 2015. Some of the accomplishments, and most recently, if you read in the, in the press, um, uh, we have been our, our partners and the hub, in, in addition to many of the Pacific Island countries that are part of OPERA, 
have joined the, uh, the local um, Island 2030 network. Uh, we have done um, uh, sharings and we have also um, presented and we most recently, uh, Hawaii uh, uh, Green Growth led a delegation to the uh, 79th General Assembly of the UN and uh, we also uh, pre presented at the summit which was mentioned earlier this morning uh, to talk about the perspectives of islands um, we talked about um, our dashboard because we keep track. You can't uh, say that you're making progress if you don't keep track and report out and hold yourselves accountable. So again, if you go to the Hawaii Green Growth website, you'll see the Aloha Plus Challenge. You'll also see what's called the Aloha Plus Dashboard. We measure ourselves. We hold ourselves accountable. The good news on ma many of the major things like energy uh, and on um, uh, you know, some, some sustainability areas, we've made quite a bit of progress. We're almost there. In fact, we've met, we're halfway there for our 100% goal. We're at 35% now for renewable energy. And um, we're trying to make sure that we do use technology and we do things to, to uh, achieve what we've committed to uh, as far as the, uh, the, the challenge areas. So we've identified six priority areas and related targets to be achieved by 2030. And that's not too far away from our end goal of 2045 of 100% renewable energy and 100% decarbonization. And we hold ourselves accountable by doing voluntary local review, which is supposed to demonstrate, and it does, it reiterates the significance of how local level actions and local communities play an integral role in driving uh, sustainable development. And so, I think grassroots really matters. We can talk, you know, at the at the uh, you know the the kind of atmospheric level. We can come to international conferences, but when the rubber meets the road, when we have to go home to our communities and actually implement, when we when we challenge ourselves to do what what the speakers this morning said, it takes each of us to go back home, implement these solutions, make it happen, and then come back to share lessons learned. So I just want to. Um, one thing that I want to give recognition to the local 2030 network hub, we've long transitioned, um, you know, uh, going from sustainability to the next step of regeneration. It's not just enough to, um, to do sustainability. It's focusing on actively restoring and enhancing the social, uh, cultural, and ecological and economic well-being of our communities, not just to be sustainable, but to go back and regenerate, to, to thrive, to build on what... Uh, our fundamental frameworks of, of, uh, of our cultures. So what we've done in Hawaii in order to make this happen is we've developed policies and programs in three major areas of the economy for Hawaii, for our island economy. One I've mentioned, uh, clean energy innovation. We have been leading in terms of distributed energy resources. So those of you who are, I see some electrical engineers who know what I'm talking about in terms of smart grid technology, in terms of microgrids, in terms of uh, deployment of virtual power plants so we're not uh, stuck to the old model of how we deliver energy and electricity to rural communities. We've been uh, adopting and demonstrating the success that you can do this uh, efficiently. Uh, you can use renewable energy. You can uh, electrify transportation. You can decarbonize transportation with alternative fuels. Lots of work being done in Hawaii on renewable hydrogen. Uh, you know, harvesting uh, methane and other materials and uh, using um, excess solar uh, to create uh, renewable hydrogen, uh, avoiding methane emissions, trying to have a, a, a totally sustainable loop in, in creating uh, uh, alternative fuels because right now, as isolated islands, we import our fuel, right? Imported oil, imported diesel. And uh, until we get off of that, by totally being either renewable energy or producing locally, uh, other alternative fuels. We can't break that cycle. So we've been doing that and we have been um, leading in terms of uh, you know, the policy. People like myself or other local leaders in Hawaii that go out and share that story and, and so that people can learn from, learn from our lessons, mistakes we've made, not repeat them. And also maybe replicate some of the best practices. Uh, we're not saying do it exactly like how we do it, but there could be uh, uh, things that we've, we've, uh, we've uh, enabled and implemented so that people can leapfrog over what we've done and get there even faster and more efficiently. Uh, the other thing that we've working working on, which is very different for uh, approach, is regenerative and sustainable tourism. Most island economies are very dependent now on tourism, uh, and it's not uh, you know it's not a, a, 
some places ecotourism, but usually it's the, the typical resort tourists come in, use the resources, make an impact maybe, uh, don't contribute to the community, and then leave. Uh, you know, uh, you know re employ the workforce at maybe lower level, not skilled jobs. So what we're trying to do is really uh, develop um, the transition from sustainability to, um, to regeneration. And then that was, at the last summit, that was what the local uh, hub, that's what the Pacific Island nations who attended the summit said that we need to do this as part of the agenda going forward. We have to think about regenerative development goals. We move beyond just sustainability. And that idea is taking hold uh, among the thought leaders at the UN General Assembly. That was what the report was back that came back to us in Hawaii, that this is something that people are embracing and realizing. Uh, and it's coming from an, an island perspective. So it's something that we as island nations, island communities, were able to share uh, because we, we live that world every day. We live that reality. Um, and uh, so we convene, as I said. We want to be a convening place. So what Hawaii has done is played a leadership role in convening other nations. So um, most recently, um, we started this in, in 2023. We convened um, nearly 40, 40 island economies across the Pacific, Africa, and the Caribbean in Honolulu, over 100 experts came that were focused on uh, the, doing a network of, of, of data for climate resilience and sustainable and regenerative uh, t uh, tourism uh, practices. We had workshops, you know, did the deep dive, came up with action so that people can actually uh, hands-on capacity building, design and implement plans, and then share, you know, what we said, bright spots and also uh, island-led solutions as well as lessons learned of what not to do, you know, what mistakes that we have made that we can be transparent and honest about. We tried this and it didn't work. You know, what, what lessons did we learn? So we are continuing to do that. We just did that again in April of 2024, hosted over 40 islands from around the world, and that includes places like the Netherlands, the Caribbean. You wouldn't think of the Netherlands and you wouldn't think of parts of the North Atlantic being islands, but there are islands up there that live quite the sustainable, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenges as well. And then last thing, the other third sector is the knowledge-based economy. I think that's a, uh, when we saw the last panel, they talked about how do you promote actually climate change uh, diplomacy? How do, you, how do you promote that? Well, historically, Hawaii, we've always been a meeting place, a gathering place. In fact, if you, uh, you take the word Oahu, which is the name of the main island in, in uh, Hawaii, it translates from Hawaiian to gathering place. So we see that when you have a beautiful paradise, as many Pacific Islands are, a beautiful place, a natural place, uh, that people can come and uh, be renewed, for one thing, physically, but then also come in a safe and stable area to, to talk and to, uh, to discuss and address very serious, challenging issues. Um, it basically becomes a living laboratory uh, for research and development. Many new things are being tried in, in um, uh, Hawaii, things like I said, microgrid, uh, things in agriculture like seaweed uh, for cattle feeds that, that reduces methane emissions, uh, things even uh, uh, basic, uh, you know, technologies to harvest, as I said, uh, methane from landfills and sewage treatment plants to make renewable natural gas and alternative fuels from, from biomass, uh, things called genki balls, which are uh, good bacteria and probiotics that uh, can uh, eat toxins and um, from polluted waterways. So many innovative R&D type things that you wouldn't think happening. I mean, when you think of R&D, you think of other places on the continental, the big continent. But islands, because we're small, we can demonstrate, we can replicate, we can do things at a smaller scale that are piloted efficiently, effectively, and then can be taken to a larger scale. So um, the, as far as international policy and, di and diplomacy as well, the geopolitics of the region in, in, in the Indo-Pacific are very complex. Joel alluded to some of the issues uh, that are uh, affecting us. We talked about you know, uh, those happening in, in other areas of, of, the, of the world. But in the, in the Indo-Pacific region, there's a lot of issues, a lot of tensions. Um, and uh, Hawaii is a very much a strategic center for that in terms of national security, energy security, global security. Uh, there are partnerships with many of the, of the stakeholders that have come to this conference today. Japan, Korea, uh, you know, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, countries that are very much affected by the geopolitics in the Indo-Pacific region. The head uh, of our security uh, 
uh, globally, Indo-PACOM, which is the military theater for, that takes from the uh, eastern uh, shoreline of Africa all the way to the west coast, so that whole region is based in Hawaii. Um, NSA has a headquarters in Hawaii. So it's a very strategic military center. You don't think about that because you think of us, oh, fun and sun and tourism. You know, maybe you think of us as maybe, you know, University of Hawaii is a nice place to do some R&D on certain things, but we are a very critical uh, infrastructure island, a very critical national and global security island that plays a very key role. And the East-West Center, which was formed in the 1960s, uh, and many of you have done uh, uh, tours of duty, shall I say, at East-West Center or, uh, you know, visiting scholars at East-West Center. Uh, so you know that historically we have served that purpose to convene uh, uh, global leaders from Asia, Pacific, and the rest of the world to discuss international policy and tough issues uh, and address peace and justice uh, not only in our region, but in, in the world and the balance of, of things that we, you know, we are grappling with again today. And most recently, the Local Islands 2030 Network has also assumed the role of facilitator and convener, which is very important. Sometimes you need to have a, a place and an entity that is not threatening, that is, that is neutral, and that is also beautiful and serene to be uh, a facilitator and convener, and that is what we're doing for our sister island communities and nations across the Pacific region. When we address climate change, when we address uh, climate change action, when we address uh, resilience and mitigation and sustainability. So these are some of the things that uh, we're trying to do, some of the lessons learned, and um, uh, to uh, try to foster a collaborative space physically and um, conceptually. Um, so I uh, want to leave it on a positive note uh, before I turn it over. Yeah, back absolutely. To Mike. Thank you. Yeah, or a passionate note, I should say, <laughs> in many, many respects. One of the things we learned, at least I learned this morning, I think I was aware that the Gobi Desert had a very extreme climate, um, but I didn't realize it was Mars-like. Well, I guess we can talk, um, Diana can speak to coming from, the, um, coming from Phoenix, mm -hmm. um, a very different and unique uh, climate um, challenge and uh, how um, the region is dealing with that. And Hawaii, too. I mean, the Big Island yeah. is like the volcanic, the black of volcanic. I mean, we, the, the lunar uh, group, uh, NASA's right. lunar program used to train on, train on the Big Island because That's of right. that, the lunar scape. So. Thank you. Well, I am originally from Australia. I'm not going to make you say good day because that is not as elegant as aloha. Um, I do love that. I would like to say a big thank you to the dialogue organizers and also to the Fijian CCC. If for no other reason, to your point, is if you haven't noticed, Phoenix has been in the newspaper quite a lot. Um, we've just had 110 days over 40 degrees Celsius. That is a record. On many days, it does not overnight get below 35 degrees Celsius, which means the heat that is absorbed during the day cannot actually release. We're anticipating that we'll have over 1,000 people who will die because of heat-related causes this year, which will be a record. Um, we don't track it necessarily well, and we don't have a fatality review, um, but we are moving to do fatality review because of this extreme heat. Um, as you can imagine, it is our most vulnerable members of the community, um, our homeless population, our elderly population who are in mobile homes. Um, so we have made the news for a number of reasons and not necessarily good. So we are dealing with climate change, um, but it is really heat. Um, for those of you who don't know, Phoenix is the fastest growing city in the country and has been for seven years in a row, which doesn't make sense when you just link it back to the extreme heat. Maricopa County, which is the fourth largest county in the country, is the fastest growing county in the United States. And this is because we have the data centers moving in. So time on semiconductor, Intel, we do not have natural disasters per se, so we make a really nice location for these big fabs. So there is extensive growth going on in Phoenix, yet we are challenged by heat, we are challenged by aging infrastructure, we are challenged by a lack of water, um, and we're also being challenged by air pollution. Um, so I want to tell a little bit of a story of how we are working together, and it picks up on what we've really heard. 
So we need action, and we need it now. Um, one of the challenges is we have one big city, which is the city of Phoenix, a population of 2 million, but we have these 21 other cities and towns in Maricopa County that are much smaller and don't have scale. So Apache Junction has a population of 10,000, and when they want to roll out an initiative, they may not be able to procure because they're not at scale. So in 2017, my colleague and I, Dominic Papa, realized the competitive advantage of Maricopa County and the city of Phoenix was not that it was the fifth largest city in the country, it was the fact that we had five million people in a county and that our competitive advantage was collaboration. If you go to the private sector and you say we have five million people and we're working together to address some of these sustainability and resilience challenges, I can assure you, you'll get their attention. But traditional issues around procurement, around governance was a real barrier of how to do this. So knowing that we needed to move and we needed to move quickly because of what was happening in our backyard, we actually established a consortium that brought together the 22 cities and towns, the university, ASU, which is the largest research university in the country. We have 5,000 faculty and we have 125,000 students on campus. Um, which people look at me and yes, that is crazy. We brought our economic development agency together and also our planning agency. And the idea was that we would create a collaborative environment where we would address regional challenges together. Because let me assure you, when you're dealing with transportation, if you're going between three different cities in a day, having one city work on one set of signaling means that, yes, you might zoom through Tempe or zoom through Phoenix, but when you hit Scottsdale, you're going to hit traffic. So interoperability between the cities was crucial to what we were doing. Now, one of the big issues we actually dealt with in 2017, 2018, as we were pulling this together, was the issue of political risk. You know, we were seeing all of these technology companies going to, into these cities and trying to sell the solutions that the cities didn't even know they needed and most of the time they didn't. But the benefit of having a large research university at the very heart of this collaboration is what do universities do really well? We fail really well. Like, we are designed to fail. You think about it, anybody who's done a PhD or a postdoc, what do you do? You fail. You take something, you give it a try, it will never work the first time, and then you go back and you test and you test again. So we have four campuses spread across this region, and we have 35,000 engineers who want to actually be involved in tangible change. But we also have the social scientists. We have the business people who can actually do the ROI and who can actually do real-time evaluation. So when I'm going out to a mayor, and they know that they need a solution to address air pollution, if we can say that we can test it on campus, in situ, in their backyard, and show proof of concept, we can remove the political risk. We started to see the private sector coming to us. Um, and knocking on ASU's door is not fun for the best of times, but if you have a center for smart cities in the regions, at least they know where the front door is. So we were having the Intels, the AWSs, the Deloitte's coming to us and saying, there is scale here and we want to collaborate. So rather than us having to go out to them, they were coming to us. We had natural competitors coming to us as well because they realized when you have a market of 5 million people, there is enough in that market for competitors to share. That included the power companies and the water companies. Now, we have started to address some of those big regional challenges. Interoperability is fundamental to all of this, addressing the water shortage, addressing urban heat islands. Everything is shared among the collaborating partners for the idea is we all benefit when one city does something well and we can move that across the other 21 cities. But we've also learned many of the solutions we've been developing, which are generally open source, can be then deployed by other cities and regions around the world. And to Joel's point, some of it is 80% plug and play with you putting on the regional difference. What has been exciting is that we're not just addressing the infrastructure challenges per se. When COVID hit, we realized a million people in the county did not have access to the internet. 20% of our community, and we are, yes, cities, but we have regional. 
Now, without the access to the internet, you do not promote the educational opportunities which drive some of these solutions. You do not create opportunities for the youth to engage in the educational learning to think about the solutions going forward. So one of the things that we've been doing in partnership with the county is addressing the digital divide. By doing that, we then strengthen the infrastructure and build in resilience. Um, and now we are seeing real action and activity around this. We have digital twins that we're using to deploy where we put buildings, where we create shade, how to create these urban heat environments. But we're also seeing the soft touch in terms of the city of Mesa, for example, has created the first ever city that is autism friendly based on smart city technologies, which when you talk about smart city technologies, that's not where you go. But if you want to create solutions that are attractive and can stick, thinking about the people and the quality of life is central to that. So we have been our own living lab with 5 million people. Some of them know it, other people don't. Um, but it's really exciting to see what can happen when you bring the university, the private sector, the planning agencies and economic development together and you commit to working together. And let me stress, there is so much competition between the 22 cities in terms of what they're doing, but they're doing it to better the region with the idea of the sharing. And that is how we're accelerating the delivery of solutions to the region. So thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share the story and what we've been working on for the last six or seven years. That was great. Thank you, Diana. Um, I'm sure Joel, you're hearing some of what Diana just said, talking about five million people in four campuses. <laughs> Going back to your question and a uh, plea for for resources is just a strikingly different, um, you know, parameters. At the same time, you're also talking about people without the internet, and you're talking about a similar situation. So, um, you know, we do have a lot of those um, um, some similarities that cut across. Uh, that uh, communities are still dealing with and struggling with. So I do want to leave time for questions from the audience. So as you're thinking, let me just um, pose a, a question to, to the panelists and, and um, we'll, um, please um, um, be ready to, to, to leap in and ask some, some questions. Um, I think the one takeaway that at least I get from all of the presentations and, and just really full, fulsome information is this, you know, we always think of a resilient infrastructure in physical terms. I mean, I think people are always thinking of stronger buildings or, or more resilient power grids, and that is all critical and important, but I think as your slides show, yep. there is a point at which humans can't design to, to, to save, the, you know, to, to carve out that space. Oh God, the one thing that kind of I, I drew out from your presentations is um, it's not obviously resilient infrastructure is not just is not physical um, um, property or et cetera. It is the humans. It is collaboration. It is human knowledge, I heard, human collaboration, human capital, human know-how. This is coming out just consistently in each of your presentations as a gathering place, as a need for more gathering, as a gathering that, that is trying to sort itself out given you know, a lot of resources and a lot of competing interests. Um, if you were to wave a wand, and I will keep it short, um, what kind of what kind of res human resource collab collaborative resource, what kind of um, um, you know um, center for knowledge and information, what kind of um, um, you know um, um, planning um, or, or direction that do you, would you like to see happen that is not happening that would really make a huge difference in, this, um, in the challenges you talked about? Sure. Let me start with you, Joel. Yeah, uh, so one of the things I started looking at, uh, and we had the Trans-Pacific Sustainability Dialogue, two people from the Pacific. If you go online and you start looking at, say, resilient infrastructure, and you say, let's look at the Pacific, and let's look at Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, Solomon, Kiribati, Tuvalu, let's look at any one of them. And let's see, where's the body of knowledge that exists? The 20 years from now, if somebody was sitting down and doing a research at this university, wanting to know what's happening in the Pacific, it's almost non-existent. Because when we talk about Pacific, generally the focus is on Asia. Uh, that is where, when we say the global south, that is where we generally refer to. And you'll find a lot of these academic papers in academia. Now, uh, being a non-academic, one of the things I did last year was 
you know, go through the pain of writing five papers and getting them published. Because I said, you know, 20 years from now, somebody will sit down and that is adding to that body of knowledge. We don't have that. If you uh, want to look at women in energy or you want to look at how they're uh, coming into the STEM area, almost in the Pacific, it's almost non-existent. We do have the numbers from the universities of people enrolling, but that is where we stop. And so how do we build that body of knowledge? And that is where, after working through the two regional networks of Opera and Pinsa, we came up with the idea that we needed to have a regional center that would be able to do capacity building, yes. Uh, and in capacity building, we not only, uh, it's not running trainings. We're building a knowledge management system. So say somebody sitting in uh, Solomon Islands has just been appointed. Now, in Tuvalu and Kiribati, the regulator is just one person in the, uh, sitting in, the gov in a government department. Uh, Solomon Island has got two people, and they're two in a government department, so they're not independent uh, or out of government. They're just government officials doing this work. The idea is somebody can go in, log into a online uh, knowledge management hub, log in from Solomon's, and go through maybe presentations, maybe go through uh, you know YouTube-style videos, go through some uh, uh, trainings. That would give you the basis of where to start from. And the basics are basically, you know, governance. What are the project governance issues? Uh, what are some of the issues that are not only uh, limited to that particular country, but in the region as well? Then what are the tools that has been developed in the region and contextualized for the local uh, communities? And is that working and how is that working? So you could access that body of knowledge sitting in anywhere in the world. And so that is one area that we're looking at when we say capacity building. The other is looking at mentorship programs. So if you want to build capacity, how do you leapfrog? Say somebody sitting in a corner village in Bua in Fiji, and says a female, and we go and talk about the need for women to get into this energy space, where does she go? I mean, where is the mentorship? Uh, you go to the university, you have to run through the same course that everybody else runs through. So there is no special mentorship program that's available, and uh, we've talked to the uh, president of your university on whether there's a potential to collaborate and get uh, you know women uh, to partner with researchers in in Korea and uh, you know at other universities, so that researchers can also look at the Pacific context, maybe compare and contrast, see what are the differences, and there can be similarities, uh, as uh, you know, as uh, Diana mentioned in in Arizona, there's communities, the cities that are, I mean, counties that are small. In, in the Pacific, they are not counties, they are countries <laughs> <laughs> that are small. So maybe they have similarities and maybe we can work on what those similarities are and maybe there's a solution. Maybe one side does not fit all. Right. And so the idea is to add, create that research, add to that body of knowledge and then work with these regulators to get the bottleneck out. Fantastic. So toolkit with humans <laughs> very, very engaged and very yeah. involved. What does your wand look like, <laughs> Lorraine? Yeah, I think uh, it's probably, uh, you know, telling that uh, the, the voice that came up while I was uh, trying to turn my iPad <laughs> off was uh, Nainoa Thompson. And if uh, any of you have Googled Nainoa Thompson, you know he's the head of uh, a, 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 a private group uh, called the Polynesian Voyaging Society. And many of you have probably read in the press about the double hull canoes, the hokulea that's um, gone around the world, uh, uh, navigating the ch training young people, uh, you know, with some of the, um, the elders that have come from the Pacific Islands uh, and know the way of wayfinding, where they navigate by the stars. But in that process, it's teaching the cultural values, which I think we can have conferences. We talk about, you know, the concepts, the policies. We can share the technical data. But I think that uh, the value, at least from the Pacific region and from Pacific communities and rural communities everywhere, that local cultural value, if we could have a place, whether you take groups around the world to share that, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's in a community in Mongolia or uh, you know, a community in Hawaii, you share some of those values and you're able to, to have people share in that, young people. I think that builds the next generation and when you teach culture, you teach respect, you appreciate culture, and many of the indigenous uh, peoples, whether in Australia, New Zealand, Maori, you know, mm -hmm. Aboriginal uh, culture, uh, in Pacific Islands, parts of uh, you know uh, Asia, many of the indigenous cultures have that uh, ingrained value of sustainability. It's a, it's an unspoken thing. It's kind of like mm -hmm. we talk about a word in Japanese, kimochi. It's a feeling, you know. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know, or 
uh, it's mana'o in Hawaiian, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm sure in every language in this room, there is that same concept, you know, mm -hmm. corazon, the heart. It's something about that comes from inside. And that's something, uh, you know, as we have more political divisions, as we have more conflict, that might be the magic wand. You know, we're all humans. Mm -hmm. There is no planet B, as, yep. uh, as we have been reminded <laughs> time and time again today. There is no planet B. Even if you think you can get in that rocket with SpaceX, uh, a certain SpaceX uh, billionaire and go to Mars on your own, uh, good luck with that. But until we can do that, um, we, this is, uh, we are tied together. We are connected by what our uh, 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 colleague from, uh, from Fiji, the prime minister, the original prime minister, the president, president, right, has said, we're all in the same canoe. And we say that in Hawaii. We have to make sure we grow together in the same canoe, and that's part of what comes from inside. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm glad you made that point because I was thinking the same thing that you know, earlier this morning. You're talking about the challenge of you know, political will or po political leadership or, or even just division and, and really how um, you know, if you make environmental issues a local community issue, is this creek important? Yes, it's important to the community, right? Well, then that's a place to build, right? And the values that, that the community has about their place, right, and their home and that that building outward kind of you know, insulates some of those um, divisions, basically. Um, so if the wand is not sitting out in the sun all day and not too hot <laughs> to touch, uh, what, was your, what would your wand look like? Well, I will agree yeah. with these two um, solutions. I would also add, and I get to do this because I'm a professor, I think shame on universities. Um, we are educational institutions that have phenomenal resources and brilliant talent. And this morning, for example, I read an article where some engineering students created a mechanical tongue and worked out it took 227 licks to get to the middle of the lollipop. Great, fantastic, good on you. But universities still remain as ivory towers, despite saying they they not. We need universities to work with the partners in the communities identifying what their challenge is and working backwards, rather than the university saying, I've got you, and this is a great idea, let's create a mechanical tongue. We need them on the ground with the toolkits, with the people working backwards to solve for what these communities are addressing. And until we flip that switch in terms of how universities work, we have got many missed opportunities for actually creating real solutions now. And as somebody who works with people aged from 18, to 65 some of our students, every single one of my students wants to be out of the classroom, in the community, creating real change. They look at me and say, why do I have to learn this theory when I could be practically engaged driving change today? And it's a really strong argument, and you can see the passion. So we need to switch the model. We need to draw on those young people yeah. and be out doing yeah. this differently. Great. Yeah. Spoken just, perfectly as an associate dean for applied research. And <laughs> just don't tell ASU I said that. I hope nobody's recording me. But if I have tenure, I can't. Chatham House rules. Chatham House rules. Yes. Well, very passionate also in that in that same direction. So there is very limited time. But if there are any like one or two questions, let's just take them quickly. And please go to the microphone so we can we can all hear. And then um, we'll ask our panelists. We'll just take take two questions at the most. And then we'll have um, folks answer, reply. Yes, go ahead. Thank um, you. Yeah, I'm Julie Shea. I'm a Stanford alum, class of 98 in human biology. And um, also <laughs> the artist yes. in, of this um, painting called Hope's Light. So thank you all for being here today and sharing your experiences. And we're all hopeful for a brighter future. I'm also um, the past president of Stanford Club of Taiwan. So, you know, you say we're all in the same canoe. And I know because of geopolitical reasons that Taiwan is not often included in these conversations. But when you see what happened during COVID-19 epidemic, Taiwan did so well. Like the first year of the COVID to 2020, I was in Taiwan because I ended up you know, going back to live there as an adult from 2014 to 2021. And we had in-person school. So, which was very different from what was happening in the U.S. 
Um, the first year of the pandemic, because of our experience with SARS, we just mm, put yes. on our masks. Mm -hmm. We have yes. very strict quarantine at our, I mean, we're an island. We're another island yes, nation. You are. Um, so we did very well that first year that everyone wanted to go to Taiwan in 2020 on this gold visa. I mean, in fact, Steve Chen is still there. You know, he came to Taiwan and, um, you know, during that time. So I just want to just remind people, please don't forget about Taiwan. We want to help. Um, and today is actually the national day right. of Ten. Taiwan Republic of Ten. China, Ten. which is yeah. our official name. Yeah. We're celebrating our 113th birthday. Um, and I was invited to, you know, attend the event in Seattle where I'm based because I usually invited to sing, to be in part of the opening um, and sing the U.S. national anthem, and then we also have someone sing the Taiwan national anthem. But I came here because I felt it was very important, you know, to represent Taiwan. And also, I'm very, very grateful to Director Yi Wu Shin for um, having a new Taiwan program that just, um, you know, was inaugurated in May of this year at A Park. So just super, super grateful for that. And grateful to all of you, you know, for being here today and, and learning from each other. So wow. it's sort of a well, that's very nice, thank you. And I know, <laughs> I know how excited the center is to integrate Taiwan into the, into the study and curriculum and focus here at A Park. Absolutely, thank you for that. Any other comments or questions before we close? Um, could be quick, nothing here stood out. Well, I will ask if there's, if any of the panelists have a question for another panelist before we close. We really just have a couple of minutes, but is there anything you were dying to know from one another? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're all working in the same hub, so I think you have common experiences. Well, with that, um, there's no need to then, so we are at time anyway, so we'll just call it here. But I really want to thank the panelists. Thank you for your attention. Um, um, the, maybe there are brownies back there, so you can uh, go for, for, uh, for, for the coffee break. And um, again, just a real appreciation to the panelists for all their preparation and presentations today. Thank you.